Look, hundred years at the hundred years, they done lied to us about this and that. Told us all we from Africa and made fiction characters turn into facts. Harry and Tubman, then it was not. No goddamn well that trick was capped. My wife and I wrote a book about it, and it's book with knowledge, evidence, and fact. My other book got them haters shook, cause it's helping my people take a closer look. Had their backgrounds in the background, show my people where they post a look. Show my people where they get it from, where they hit it from, all sorts of angles. When it comes to this research, you must please first, don't trust strangers. Find out not all of your own is what I highly recommend and suggest. And if you're looking for unsensitive content by me, I highly recommend you the best. Which is my website at the link you see just across the screen. Don't let it miss you, I make it simple. I double down on that black and white, it's too official. I mean, it's really important for us to remember our history. You know, uh, uh, unless you're one of the first Americans, and you came from someplace else. Somebody brought you. Uh, I, that probably is me, absolutely. Because I'll tell you what, if you look, if you look at some of the reservations that you've approved, you, sir, and your great wisdom have approved, I will tell you right now, uh, they don't look like Indians to me, and they don't look like the Indians. Now, maybe we say politically correct or not politically correct. They don't look like Indians to me, and they don't look like Indians to Indians. And a lot of people are laughing at it, and you're telling how tough it is, how rough it is to get approved. Well, you go up to Connecticut, and you look. Now, they don't look like Indians to me, sir. You don't have to live in the slums to care, Melanie. You don't have to try to be something you're not. Oh, God, I can't stand this. Trying to be something I'm not? Trying to be proud of my African heritage? If that's being something I'm not, then fine. If that's being something I'm not, then fine. I'd rather be dead than be like you. Stuck up near who's ashamed of being black. My grandmother was a full-blooded Iroquois, was a full-blooded Iroquois, was a full-blooded Iroquois, was a full-blooded Iroquois. I know all of that, Mama. They know this. I am alive because of the blood of a people who never scraped or begged or apologized for what they were. They asked only one thing of this world, to be allowed to be. And I learned through the blood of these people. That black isn't beautiful. It isn't ugly. It isn't kinky hair. It isn't straight hair. Black is just black. It broke my heart when you changed your name. I gave you my grandmother's name, a woman who bore nine children <laughs> and educated them all. Who held off six white men with a shotgun when they tried to drag one of her sons off to jail <laughs> for not knowing his place. And you had to reach into an African dictionary to find a name that would make you proud. Okay, everyone. Now, as I've stated numerous times before, 
I am well aware that many of you were taught to believe line after line in today's society of America concerning this topic and various types of correlating information by design. But I would like for you to note that the actual quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. The so-called African Americans of today's society are yet still struggling to come to grips with their true identities, cultures, heritage, and especially their actual history, simply because of how they were taught to believe in a fictitious story that claimed that all people of color in America are somehow descendants of Africans. The problem with this story is that there is no verifiable evidence of it actually being truthful information. I'll get into why here shortly. And yet, there are many so-called blacks or so-called African Americans that are willing to go to their graves with a very strong belief in this falsified information. See, this is why I single-handedly write, edit, and produce my content for viewers like yourself in hopes that you would take the initiative to literally note all of the information that I present throughout my content so that you may be inspired to conduct your own research using those same key factors manifested within my works. Now with all of that being said, let's go back in time a little to where this fictitious propaganda was cultivated and implemented into our mindsets as a fact of one-sided historic information. Melville Jean Herskovics was born on September 10th, 1895 in Bellefontaine, Ohio to two Jewish immigrant parents who immigrated from parts of Europe to North America during the mid-1800s. His mother, Henrietta Hart, was an immigrant from Germany and his father, Hermann Herskovics, was an immigrant from Hungary. Before becoming a teenager, the family moved to El Pasco, Texas in 1905. Then soon after his mother abruptly passed away from a mysterious illness, Melville and his father moved to Erie, Pennsylvania, where Melville later graduated from Erie Senior High School in 1912. Melville began his college studies at the University of Cincinnati while simultaneously taking rabbinacle studies at the Hebrew Union College, Cincinnati campus, as traditionally suggested by his family, being as though the college is a Jewish institution of religion. When the United States involved themselves in the conflict known as World War I on July 28, 1914, History loves to state that Melville allegedly quelled his studies to enlist in the quote, Army's medical corps and headed off to Europe. Now, keep in mind that his mother was from Germany and his father from Hungary, in which both places, including Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire, fought against Russia, Italy, France, Japan, Romania, Great Britain, and of course, the United States. What's very noteworthy here is which side of the conflict Melville allegedly subscribed to. Because there is no actual records of him enrolling in the United States Army in the first place. Yeah, and I'm just getting started here. Now, when he returned to North America, Melville transferred to the University of Chicago at a time where anthropology was heavily influenced by the deceitful hidden agendas of industrialism, along with political European colonialism, where pseudoscientific theories were not only praised by one particular group of people, but justified for its subjugation of all non-white people. Before World War I began, in a speech directed to accredited businessmen, President Woodrow Wilson stated that henceforth public policy will be geared to providing a public education tailored to producing industrial workers who did not question orders and were skilled in only basic manual labors, and that a liberal education will be reserved for only for a small elite. By the early 1900s, 
American industrialists recognized that compulsory public education was the most useful means to socially engineer the American population to suit the purposes of industrial capitalism. Local networks of corporate foundations, university education and psychological departments, educational accrediting boards, and governmental agencies arose to oversee the implementation of the blueprint for this ambitious but yet so devastatingly evil social engineering project. These entities included organizations such as the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, the Columbia Teachers College, the University of Chicago, the National Training Labs, the National Education Association, and the U.S. Office of Education, now known as the Department of Education. Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, and Henry Ford were the key contributors and introductional architects of this American educational system of forced schooling. According to Lee D. Baker, an author and a cultural anthropologist out of Duke University, he admitted that the 19th century physical anthropologist drew specious correlations between anatomical features and supposed behavioral traits of the various races. So in other words, these immigrants of Jewish or other European or African descent of the 19th century, or rather the 1800s, purposely created and cultivated the science of anthropology with highly regarded racial discriminatory, very identical to the pseudoscientific concepts designed and utilized by Francis Galton that he called eugenics, right along with his predecessor, Charles Darwin, with his theory of evolution and natural selection, in which I mentioned more about this on my documentary called What's the Real Identity of an African American? I highly recommend that you watch that video as well. Now, getting back to Melville, he abruptly halted his studies at the Hebrew Union College and then moved on to complete his graduate studies at Columbia University. What's very important to note here is while working on his master's and PhD, Melville found himself under the guidance of his professor named Franz Boas, a German immigrant from Minden, Germany, who migrated to North America during the year of 1887. Franz Uri Boas was considered to be the sole author of American anthropology. In fact, he was dubbed as the grandfather of American anthropology by his self-proclaimed significant students, with Melville being one of them. As a professor of anthropology at Columbia University beginning in 1899, France heavily influenced many prominent people that we know of today, all the way up until his death on December 21st, 1942, and some of whom shares the same hue of complexion as you and I. France had his own hidden agenda, but history loves to paint the picture as if it was done for the better good, when in fact it was designed to upkeep the continuation of manipulative indoctrination. For example, France promoted an idea that Negroes residing in America are all somehow descendants of Africans in Africa, based solely on the fact that we all share the same hue of complexion, and that's it, meaning that's all of the evidence he had. Now keep in mind that this was the first time ever in history where people overheard rumors that Negroes are somehow Africans now. Then, the Harvard-taught sociologist and one of the co-founders of the NAACP and the first so-called person of color to even earn a doctorate at this time named W.E.B. DuBose took this fictitious idea to new heights, being as though he was considered to be a person of color, providing another side of social engineering influence amongst people that shared his same hue of complexion. In fact, Franz Boas influenced W.E.B. DuBose in his teachings, even while being a professor of sociology, economics, and history at Atlanta University. Franz taught and told Melville Herskovics, along with his other students, and even W.E.B. DuBose, 
what to do and what not to do by sending private letters back and forth throughout the years of the early 1900s. Then soon after his fictitious idea transitioned into a plan, it was later implemented into U.S. history books systematically. But of course, France had assistance, and the majority of this assistance is credited to Melville, being as though he began to create the anthropometric studies of the so-called African Americans, while simultaneously releasing science fictional and general fictional books, like for example, The Cattle Complex in East Africa in 1926. This science of anthropology dramatically changed once Melville introduced his out of Africa theory. During a time when biological theory still prevailed in anthropology during the late 1920s, in which the underlining belief was that so-called blacks were genetically inferior to whites. Now, in order to draw all of the credit and attention to his own work for possible federal funding, Melville mysteriously but yet purposely had a fallen out with W.E.B. DuBose and began to state that DuBose's work is inaccurate and filled with propaganda, sabotaging DuBose's quote, Encyclopedia Africana project by burning its credibility straight to the ground. Soon after that, Melville gained higher political power, then quickly received funding from wealthy private foundations and multiple federal government agencies, like the National Research Council, for example, which was established by special request from President Woodrow Wilson in 1916. What's very important to note here is DeBose's reputation was purposely attacked by the same people that established it in the first place. In other words, DeBose pledged himself under a form of order by a particular prominent group of wealthy Jews to help assist with manipulating the minds of those he could reach. And as soon as that goal was met, DeBose's entire operation was shut down. And even DeBose himself tried his very best to bring multiple prominent people of color down along with him. Side note, you would consistently see DeBose and Booker T. Washington side by side for a very particular reason. And by the way, it is not a coincidence that soon after these so-called black men visited each and every prosperous black Wall Street across America, these areas dubbed as Negro or Black Wall Streets were immediately destroyed in more ways than just one. Now, around this time, Melville was single-handedly emerging as an iconic figure in America. But the so-called funding that he received that I mentioned earlier was not to help him with researching and discovering publicly verifiable evidence as the story loves to claim. No, the funding was yet an advancement of his salary, set up for him to be paid to create and produce a story that millions of people were unfamiliar with. What I mean by that is, Melville is solely responsible for expanding the lies of storytelling, in which in turn it was later considered to be American history, by completely reversing the records of historic information by creating a fictional story about African slaves immigrating to the Americas by way of the Spaniards during the 1500s. This story is known as the Middle Passage, however, Prior to Melville's fictional story, no information existed in history that clearly mentioned that the so-called Negroes of the American lands literally came from Africa. It was said that Melville allegedly took a trip to somewhere in Africa, meaning that there is absolutely no record of this, just a story, gathered up a few artifacts from there, observed a few tribes and a few cultures, and dubbed it as Africanism, then traveled back to the US, wrote a book called The Myth of the Negro Past, and published it in 1942 in the fictional section where he claimed that the people of color in America somehow lost connection with their cultural past during the Middle Passage from Africa to the Americas. So the question remains, 
Why was Melville instructed and paid to create such a fictional story that was later dubbed as facts? Then, why would people that did not originate from this land, but fought and died to immigrate to it and colonize it, try to dominate your thinking by indoctrinating your mind into believing that you belong to somewhere other than your own home? And if you choose to believe it, you just may lose yourself and everything you own. Now, why is it important to tell you where your ancestors derived from? Because the truth lies in the knowledge of what this land really holds, and your children are the sole inheritors. But if you freely leave what is rightfully yours, then who becomes the beneficiary? I'm just here to make you think.